Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we are going to start the second portion of this class. We're going to learn a new set of invariants of topological spaces called the homology groups. So the homology groups end up being a little bit difficult to define, but after all the machinery is set up, they're much easier to work with than the fundamental group. And another great advantage they have is that they are going to see higher dimensional information of our spaces and distinguish things that our fundamental group cannot. So let's get to it. So like we've seen before, the problem with the fundamental group is that it only sees low dimensional information. Uh, so for example, if I have a CW complex, then the fundamental group of the CW complex is the fundamental group of the two skeleton. And one way to look at it is, is a positive thing. That is that, yeah, I only need to look at the two skeleton, but the negative way to look at it is that there are many CW complexes whose two skeletons are the same, but whose three skeletons are wildly different. And the fundamental group will never help us distinguish such spaces. So, uh, there do exist groups called pi k uh, for k greater than or equal to 2, but they are incredibly difficult to, comp to uh, compute. In fact, uh, computing them even for spheres is one of the most difficult problems in algebraic topology. So we're going to define groups called homology groups that come with various degrees. So we'll define homology groups which come in degrees h0 of x, h1 of x, h2 of x, and so on. And what these are going to be are abelian groups. So these are abelian groups. And this ends up being both a blessing and a curse. On one hand, it's a blessing because abelian groups are vastly, vastly simpler than general groups. We have a very easy classification that you may have seen before, at the very least could be included in an undergraduate curriculum, whereas the classification of general groups is not nearly complete. So uh, yeah, the, the fact that they're abelian is gonna help us compute them though. And roughly, hi of x sees i-dimensional holes in the space and a little less roughly h i of x detects i dimensional objects which do not bound uh, i plus one dimensional objects So let me just give you some examples so we get a feel for the theory. So in R2 minus a point, uh, so here I am, uh, this is R2, this point is missing, and this is this group h i is going to be built out of these like polygonal chains. So this is some element here of h1 of r2 minus a point. And now a question is, is this the zero element of r2 minus a point? And it turns out it is not. So the uh, 
red chain is not trivial because it is not the boundary of a two-dimensional object. For example, maybe I wanted to try to fill this in here with a disk. Well, actually, I can't fill it in with a disk because there's that hole getting in the way in the middle. Uh, so I cannot complete this thing to a disk. Uh, whereas, on the other hand, this blue chain here, this is equal to zero in H1 of R2, minus a point. Because I can fill in this triangle with a disk here. Now, the beauty of this theory is it's going to help us in higher dimensions. For example, the fundamental group also detected the non-triviality of this space in that the fundamental group of this space was the integers. Uh, also, in R3 minus a point, so I'll just, uh, I'll imagine that the whole canvas here is R3, and I'm going to cut out this point here. Is cut out. Now, I'm going to have a two-dimensional object which does not bound a three-dimensional ball. And what this looks like is I take what's called a simplex. Surrounding this point. So that point, is, you're supposed to see it as in the middle of the simplex. And this blue chain, I'm calling them chains, I'll give a proper definition of that later, is not trivial. Since I can't fill in the tetrahedron. Great. So, in fact, we'll learn that in this case, H1 of R2 minus a point is isomorphic to the integers, and it's in some sense generated by that red chain, as you would imagine. And here, H2 of R3 minus a point is also equal to the integers generated by that blue tetrahedron. So like I mentioned, there's going to be a lot of setup here. Uh, and what we're going to do is start with the, there are many flavors of homology. And we're going to start with the one that's easiest to define, but not the easiest to prove things with, just to help us build intuition here. And this is going to be called simplicial homology, and it's highly dependent on these objects called delta complexes. So recall that polygons can be cut into triangles. So for example, if I have uh, a Good old pentagon here. I can cut this into little triangles like so. So it's the union of three triangles there. Similarly, higher dimensional or let's just start with solids can be cut into what are called tetrahedra. So for example, this cube here I can 
break it up into four tetrahedra by the following process. I draw the line there, draw in this line. All right. And so you should see four tetrahedra here, uh, like one, two, three, and then the fourth is the blue piece. So shapes in general can be broken up into these nice little triangles here. And uh, similarly, this works on more intricate shapes. Topologically, these shapes I've shown you are pretty boring. But uh, here is a picture of T2. All of these vertices are the same. Uh, I have the top glued to the bottom, the left glued to the right, and I can just cut this in half. And so I see a triangle on the left and a triangle on the right here. So this also works on, for example, our non-orientable surfaces. This was T2, and here is RP2. A, but then A glued backwards, and B, but then B glued backwards, and you can do the same exact thing. And this will work for any surface. Remember, all of them have these nice polygonal representations. And so if you cut that polygon into triangles, when you start gluing things up, you don't really ruin it. Uh, so our first order of business is understanding these triangles. We're going to put a little more structure on them. These are simplices. Here's a definition. A standard n simplex delta n is the space t0 up to tn in r n plus 1 so that the sum of the ti's is equal to 1 and ti is greater than or equal to 0 for all i. So what does this look like? Well, uh, delta 0 is just a single point. It's the points in R1 where <laughs> it's, it's one point whose sum is one. That's a single point at one, right? Uh, delta one is all of the points in R2, which sum up to being one. And so you can write this as an equation x plus y is equal to 1, aka y is equal to minus x. And now we also want everything to be positive, so I look at the line y is equal to minus x where all of the coordinates are positive, and I get exactly this piece here. And we're going to give these orientations. So this will be like v0 going to v1. And similarly, delta 2 of x, or delta 2, uh, this is pretty much exactly the same procedure. You look at the equation x plus y plus z is equal to 1, aka z is equal to minus x. It's telling me in this plane, I have like a line. And z is equal to minus, so the whole equation is z is equal to minus x minus y. And so 
you can write that out and you get exactly this triangle here and we're going to orient it in this counterclockwise coherent way and so delta 2 are these triangles and finally delta 3 is going to live inside a four-dimensional space so you can't really draw how it's sitting inside of there but you can reason it all out and you get exactly this uh, tetrahedron I've been drawing. So that's the standard n simplex. Uh, but usually you want to work with some abstract numbers. It's what comes up more often in practice. So we usually write this. as delta n is equal to this symbol here is going to indicate the convex hull so it's the smallest convex set containing all of these points v0 v1 v2 up to vn and it's an alternative definition of the standard in, in, n simplex if you just take the convex hull of the points 1 0 0 0 0 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, and so on and so forth. Okay, now here's a crucial observation. Deleting a vertex and filling in the convex hull of an n-simplex leaves an n minus 1 simplex. So uh, just a, a quick example, I'm going to do a more intricate example in a second, but v0, v1, v2. If I just throw away v2, I'm left with v0 and v1, and now I need to take the smallest convex set in between v0 and v1, so it needs to include all the points on the line between them, and it's exactly that. And this is equal to a 1 simplex, right? So let me also just show you how this works on a 3 simplex. And we'll set down some notation for these things too. If I have a 3 simplex given as v0, v1, v2, v3, Then let's label these on the picture here, V0, V1, V2, and in the back there will be V3. And this face here, up in front, I will call V0, V1, V2. And maybe this face on the bottom here, I'll call, uh, well, V0, V1, V3. Great. So let's, uh, let's define these objects rigorously. So given a simplex, delta n, given as the convex hull of v0 to vn, the simplices v0 up to vi hat 
Remember this means omit vi up to vn are called faces. So there are these n minus 1 simplices, we call them faces. The union of all the faces is called the boundary. of delta n and finally the open simplex is the space the simplex minus the boundary and is denoted Delta N, and then we put a little circle on top, which reads interior. Great. So now that we have our building blocks, these simplices, we can define what it means for our space to be broken up into simplices. So a delta complex structure on a space X is a collection of maps sigma alpha from the n simplex to X well n depends on alpha so lots of different dimensions of simplices such that all right first of all the restriction uh sigma alpha restricted to the interior of each simplex is injective and for each point x in my space x x is in the image of some sigma alpha restricted to the interior of a simplex okay so this just avoids some trivialities i want to build a delta simplex structure, and I don't want you to crush, for example, every simplex to a point. That would be not very informative, and this just rules out those trivialities. Finally, or next, each restriction of sigma alpha to a face of an n simplex is one of the maps sigma beta from an n simplex into x. So the boundary of the of an n simplex is broken up into all these n minus one simplices, and I want that to be one of my maps of an n minus one simplex. It's some sort of compatibility condition. And finally I'm going to insist that this plays nicely with the topology. A set A in X is open if and only if sigma inverse of A is open in delta N for each sigma alpha. So this means two things. Well, first of all, What's the topology on delta n? You may have guessed it. It's the subspace topology coming from the fact that it's a subspace of Rn. Second of all, this is essentially uh, telling me that my space has the quotient topology given on it by, by gluing together all of these simplices. So taking that viewpoint, if a space 
has a delta complex structure then it is obtained by gluing together simplices or of course by gluing together we mean the usual thing of taking the quotient topology of the disjoint union so for example maybe I I start with some zero simplices here, uh, maybe one more, and so I build in a uh, three simplex here, maybe I glue in a one simplex there, and a one simplex here, and a one simplex here, and that's some space with a delta complex structure. And if I wanted to, I could even glue in a two simplex here. So what spaces have these structures? It turns out most of them. Uh, for example, all CW complexes have a delta complex structure. And so all of the spaces we've been working with and know and love are going to be compatible with this notion. So inside of a topological space, there are some, inside of a topological space with a delta complex structure, there are some distinguished simplices. They're called chains and boundaries. So, First of all, I'm going to define some generally pretty big abelian groups. So let uh, X be a delta complex, aka have a delta complex structure. We define delta N of X to be the free abelian group generated by the n-dimensional sim simplices on X. So Elements of delta n of x are called n chains. So, for example, uh, suppose I have a delta complex structure on S1, which looks like so, then uh, 3 times, okay, let's call this E1, plus, uh, well, let's go ahead, minus 2 times E2. This is something living inside of the one chains of S1 with this structure. So free abelian group, let me just quickly say, you, you basically take a copy of the integers for each n simplex. So here, uh, the, the whole group of n chains, of one chains in particular, is z plus c, which is just generated by e1 and e2 here. Uh, so elements of delta n of x can be written as sum over i of n i 
sigma i for n i some integer and sigma i maybe one of these maps into my space. So we want to work towards a definition of the boundary of these n chains. We want all this to sort of be oriented in a way. So recall faces are of the form V0 up to VI hat, where VI hat means I exclude exactly VI hat, VI, <laughs> uh, up to VN. Uh, we want to orient everything so that the boundary delta n is an n minus 1 chain. So it's going to be sum, sum and differences of n minus 1 simplices. How should we do this? Well, let's go by example. A line, aka one simplex, has a natural orientation goes from v0 to v1. So the boundary of v0, v1, we'll say is the uh, target v1 minus v0. Since the arrow is pointing to v1, we call that the positive one. And for a two simplex, let's orient the two simplex counterclockwise. And now we want the boundary to be consistently oriented with this counterclockwise direction. So I orient the boundary like so. And so now the boundary of V0, V1, V2 is well, I cut out V0, and then I'll get V1, V2. And that is exactly the orientation I have here in my picture. It goes from V1 to V2. But now, if I cut out V1, then I go from V0 to V2. And that's not what I see in my consistently oriented picture. I see me going from V2 to V0. So this should come with a minus. And then finally, if I cut out V2, then I go from V0 to V1, and that is consistently oriented with my picture. So that should hopefully give us enough intuitive crutch that this definition makes sense. Let sigma alpha from the n simplex to x be, well, an n simplex. Define the boundary of sigma alpha to be equal to the sum as i goes from 1 to n, oh, should go from 0 to n uh, of sigma alpha. So essentially what I'm going to do is cut out each vertex uh, so when I do that I restrict to v0 up to vi hat vn but these don't come with an orientation compatible with my other orientation unless I put this here, negative 1 to the i. And that's consistent with what we saw here before. This was i is equal to 0, and it came with a plus sign. This was i equals 1, and it came with a minus. This is i is equal to 2, and it came with a plus sign. So that's our definition on simplices. And now if the summation over alpha
N alpha sigma alpha is an N chain, then define the boundary of this N chain. So I should get an N minus one chain. There's a sum of N minus one simplices. And here's how you do it. You just push this boundary map inside. So the boundary of sigma alpha is some n minus one chain, and so this is going to be some sum of n minus one chains, aka an n minus one chain. Great. Now here's a very important lemma. If I have uh, my group of n chains, I can map down to my group of n minus 1 chains with this map here I'll call boundary n. And that's just take the boundary map, right? And then I can map down again to n minus 2 chains. And it turns out that this is the zero map. That is, let me just make it clear, this is the composition. Each of the individual maps can be highly non-trivial, but if I do two in a row, I always get the zero map. And this is usually abbreviated as delta squared is equal to zero. And you'll see this in all different places in mathematics, but here's where it started in homology. Here's the proof. So we prove it for a basis element. Sigma and uh, the group of n chains. And every other element is a sum of basis elements. And if I can show that it's a sum of a bunch of zeros, then we've proved it. Now, the boundary of sigma, an n-dimensional simplex, is the summation as i goes from 1 to n of minus 1 to the i from sigma i restricted to v0 up to vi hat up to vn. That was our definition before. So, the composition boundary n minus 1, boundary n, breaks up. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take the boundary of this uh, sum here, and it's just going to be the boundary of each piece. And so what I need to do is chop out another vj. And there's two cases here. First of all, if j is less than i, that is, I cut, I, in the first place, I cut out i. Now I'm going to cut out something j, vj. And if it's to the left, then I get this expression here. Negative 1 to the i is minus 1 to the j. Sigma restricted to v0, I'm going to cut out uh, vj, and then I'm going to cut out vi, and then I get up to vn. Plus, now there's this other case where j is greater than i. So from before I have minus 1 to the i, and then I'm going to have minus 1 to something. I'll explain this in one second, but now what we're going to have is v0 I cut out vi, and then I go on further and I cut out vj. 
And what this does is turns this piece here into a J minus one. Why? Because when I cut out VI, I shifted everything to the left and what used to be J is now J minus one. Great. And now we're pretty much done. Note that uh, every term in one also appears in two. So for example, if I cut out three and then I cut out two, it's the same thing as cutting out two and then cutting out three on the level of simplices. They're the same simplex, but they appear with opposite sign. In other words, one is equal to negative two uh, and in particular, boundary n minus one, boundary n of sigma, which is one plus two, is just equal to zero. Great. So this is a fundamental element of every homology theory. You're gonna define something called a boundary map and you're gonna show that if you do it twice, you get zero. And that is gonna allow us to draw, to define simplicial homology. We now have a setup delta n of x to delta n minus 1 of x to delta n minus 2 of x to so on and so forth. with boundary squared is equal to zero. This setup here is a, is a general algebraic setup called a chain complex. We'll be seeing many, many more of these. Now, in particular, The image of the map boundary n plus 1 is contained inside the kernel of the map boundary n, right? So if I, let me, let me extend this uh, picture up here to the right once, boundary n, delta n plus 1 of x, it's boundary n plus 1. If I do the map twice, I get zero. Therefore, whatever the image is of the first map is inside of the kernel. It is mapped to zero by the second map. Okay. Now, all groups are abelian here. And a nice thing about abelian groups is that uh, all subgroups are normal. So we can take quotients. And so here is our much awaited definition. The nth simplicial homology uh, group of a delta complex X is the group H N delta of X, which is equal to kernel of boundary of N mod the image of boundary N plus one. Remember, image boundary n plus 1 is a subgroup, kernel boundary n, so this makes sense. Uh, now, 
let's just have some more names. Kernel of boundary M. These are called uh, cycles. And image of boundary n plus 1 are called, well, they come from a boundary map, so they're called boundaries. And so what's homology measuring here? So intuitively, uh, cycles are objects with no boundary, right? The boundary map takes them to zero. So what we're measuring with homology is objects with no boundary which are not boundaries of other objects. So remember when you when you mod out by something in a group, you, you kill that off, right? So kernel mod the image are things without boundaries, and then I kill off things that come from higher dimensional boundaries. So let's do some examples. Let S1 be built with uh, one copy of a zero simplex and one copy of a one simplex. This is exactly identical to the CW decomposition uh, as follows. Here's my zero simplex and this thing is my one simplex. All right, now, n chains are the first thing you need to calculate. So zero chains, it's a free abelian group generated by zero simplices. So this is free abelian group on V0, and this is just isomorphic to Z. One simplices, this is the free abelian group generated by edges. So this is Z. And now the group generated by two simplices is the same as the group generated by three simplices, and so on and so forth. And all of these are zero. There's no two simplices to generate anything. Now I need to figure out what my boundary maps are. And I didn't mention this before, but now is a good time to do it. Delta zero is always zero. There's no such thing as the boundary of, his, of these points, the zero dimensional objects. So uh, the kernel of delta zero, it takes V zero and it sends it to zero and so everything is in the kernel is the generated by V0. Boundary one, well, what does this do to E1? It takes the terminal vertex V0 and subtracts it from the initial vertex but the initial vertex is also V0. And so boundary one 
is equal to zero. So in other words, the image of boundary one is equal to zero inside of the uh, zero chains. And the kernel of delta one is equal to everything is generated by E1. All right. And finally, delta 2 is equal to 0. We are now in a position, position to calculate the simplicial homology groups. So H0 is equal to the kernel of boundary 0 mod the image of boundary 1 the kernel of boundary zero is Z, and the image of boundary one is zero, so it's Z mod zero, and so I get Z. And H1, I'm gonna write this as H0 with this delta complex of S1. H1 of this delta complex of S1 is equal to, uh, the kernel of the boundary one mod the image of boundary two, which is just Z. Uh, the kernel is Z and the image is nothing. So there you have it. Uh, H2 of S1 is equal to H3 of S1 is equal to so on. They're all equal to zero. So a nice compact way to write this is hi of s1 is equal to z, where i is equal to 0 and 1, and 0 otherwise. Great. So a natural question is, how much does this depend on the choice of delta complex structure. And that turns out to be a really hard question, but let's first just build S1 in a different way. So let's build S1 as this. We'll go through it a little faster this time. There's V0, V1, E1, E2. So the zero simplices here are V0 and V1, and so they generate a free abelian group of rank two. Similarly, the uh, one simplices are Z plus Z, and everything else is zero. Now, the boundary of all of the zero simplices, again, is going to be zero. So nothing to check there. Boundary one of E1 is equal to V0, V1 minus V0, terminal minus initial. The boundary one of E2 is terminal minus initial V0 minus V1. And so, these together tell me that the boundary of E1 plus E2 is, well, you just add them all up, and the V1s are going to cancel, and the V0s are going to cancel. So this is 0. And you can check this is the entire kernel. So the kernel is one dimensional and it's generated by E1 plus E2. Now, 
there's no image of boundary 2. And so the first homology group of S1 with this delta complex structure is uh, it's a free abelian group generated by E1 plus E2. This is the free abelian group generated by E1 plus E2. Similarly, uh, like I mentioned, the kernel of the zero map is Z plus Z. And the image of boundary 1 is equal to uh, span of 1 minus 1, right? The boundary of E1 is not 0. So this is the V0 component, and this is the V1 component. And so if you take z plus z and you mod out by 1 minus 1, what you end up with is, is exactly z. Great. So let's do one more example or one more family of examples that shows us that homology can detect higher dimensional holes. So recall that the n-dimensional sphere is equal to the n-disk together with the n-disk. So this is like the lower hemisphere and this is like the upper hemisphere. And similar to this previous construction, the N disk is homeomorphic to the N simplex. So the N sphere is A union B with A and B equal to an N simplex. You could convince yourself of this, at least in lower dimensions. Uh, here's a one simplex together with a one simplex glued together by the identity. And you could also do this with a two simplex. If you take a two simplex and you glue on another two simplex, these are all filled in here you get S2. And it works for higher dimensional spheres too. So then my nth chain group is Z plus Z. And since I'm gluing their boundaries together, I'll get that the kernel of the boundary n, this is kind of hand wavy, I'm not going into full details here, but you can see that this is a plus b. So what you end up with is hn of sn is equal to z, and hn plus k of Sn is equal to zero for k greater than or equal to one because I didn't build this using any k plus one dimensional simplices or n plus one or n plus two dimensional simplices. The upshot is, so Sn is not equal to Sm for n not equal to m. Whatever the 
higher number of N and M is, that one's going to have a uh, Z in, in that higher homology degree, whereas the smaller one is going to cap out and isn't going to have any higher dimensional simplicity, so it's not going to have any chance of having a higher uh, homology group. But we didn't really prove anything. We haven't shown that this homology business doesn't depend on the way I broke up my space into a bunch of simplices. So we're going to stop here for now. And next class, we'll work towards getting some notion of invariance for these homology groups. We're going to define another more complicated theory. And that is going to be the one that's going to be more easy to work with abstractly. Thanks, and I'll see you again next time.